We should be sincerely and singularly focused on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, those words are very important. The, the, the word sincerely means to be authentic or to be real or to be intentional and, and to mean what you say, say what you mean, do what you mean. It means to be sincere. In other words, I'm not pretending, I'm not faking, I am sincerely going for this. But just as sincere as we should be, we should also be that singular. Now, the problem we have with the word singular is that it minimizes our life down to one thing. When we think of the idea of singular, it means that everything else is out and only one thing is in. Means to singularly focus means to I am focused on one thing. And I think in our world today, we have a real problem with discipleship or following Christ, not just saying we're Christian. You, you can go listen to the rest of the, the series if you haven't heard it, but not just saying we're Christian, not be Christian culturally or in a religious way, but literally, truly saying, I am following Christ. I am, I am denying myself, taking up my cross. I'm following Jesus. I'm doing whatever Jesus wants. I'm saying whatever Jesus says. I'm, 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 I'm following his path. I'm following his design. I'm following his desire. What I want doesn't matter. What others want for me doesn't matter. What matters is what does Jesus want for me. And we've gotten into this problem where now we see salvation as I'm asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins and then come follow me. That's really how we treat our Christianity. Jesus, I want you to forgive me. I want a ticket into heaven, but now I want you to come follow my life and be with me and just hang out with me. And whatever I do, I do. But, you know, we, we're just going to live life. We're going to go through this. And hopefully you'll be there with me, Jesus. But that's not the way Christianity works. Following Christ or being a disciple of Christ literally means I drop what I am and who I am. I mean, where do we think we get this idea? Galatians chapter two, verse 20, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live by the uh, flesh, uh, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What Paul was saying is the old Paul is dead. Everybody, everybody say, "Woo, that's exciting. The old Paul is dead. Everybody put your name in there. We're going to say that phrase again. You put your name in. The old David is dead. Say it. Come on, let's do it. The old David is dead. Well, dead people don't make decisions. Dead people don't do things their own way. They don't have an own way. Are you with me? Now, are you saying life just has to be hard and horrible and boring and religious? No, I'm saying just the opposite. Because what we don't understand is when we can get sincerely and singularly focused on the upward call of the prize of God in, in his high calling, what we're saying is the old me is dead, the new me has arisen in resurrection power. So what we don't see, and here's what we don't understand, I'm going to teach you this, I've taught you this before, but I want to teach you again. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says this, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. But in modern day, what we could actually say if we were to requote that scripture, if we wanted that scripture to define us, here's what that scripture would say. Seek first all these things and then Jesus will be added to you. What we're not understanding is that when we get singularly focused on Jesus and who he is and what he wants for our life, all these other things are taken care of. We don't have to worry about them. We don't have to worry about those needs being met. We don't have to worry about relationships. We don't have to worry about problems and issues that we face. We don't have to worry about it. Why? Because all these things shall be added unto us. All these things that everybody else worries about, God will take care that they'll add. Her. You know, it's funny to me how we find ourselves chasing after all these things and leaving Jesus back here to to, to be there when we want him, when we come back to get him, we chase after all these things thinking that somehow Jesus is going to follow us. And it's amazing to me how all these things never satisfy. It's amazing to me how all these things elude us anyway, right? 
we trying to get them, we're trying to get them, but somehow they're not happening. Sometimes I'm not satisfied. Somehow everything's not getting done. Somehow my life is not what I thought it would be. Somehow. And the truth is when you live for Jesus and you seek him first, he'll add, those things will chase you instead of you chasing them. Those blessings will come after you instead of you trying to chase after them. You don't have to worry about being focused on all these things. You be focused on Jesus and what he wants to do in your life. And let me tell you something. He'll make sure all these things are taken care of. Jesus said he wanted to give you life and more abundant life. He said he wanted your life to be filled with joy and happiness. Paul the apostle writing from a prison in this book of Philippians is saying to us, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Listen to the redundancy of that phrase. The the prefix re means to do over again. And the, the joyce means to have joy. So when he's literally saying rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice, you know what he's saying? He's saying have joy and then have some more joy and then have some more joy. And then when you're done with having some joy, you might want to have some joy. And then when you're through with having some joy, you might want to go over here and have some joy. You know what I'm saying? That's what God is saying to you. He's saying no matter your circumstances, no matter your problem, no matter your issues, you can have joy. Choose joy. Joy, that's what Paul is saying. Now listen, it would be one thing if Paul was writing to us to have joy. If his life was all peachy, how many of y'all can have joy when everything's going right and going well? Come on, somebody. How many of you can just have joy? You got, man, everything's falling. The Cowboys are winning. Uh, You know, everything's going well in life. That's pretty much my measurement. If the Cowboys are winning, everything's going pretty good. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Jesus, don't make me rebuke somebody in church. But anyway, uh, the, the truth is, the truth is, we can have joy, it seems like, when we're having good circumstances. But the true payoff of Christianity is that when you're following Christ and you're really submitted to him, that regardless of your circumstances, you can have joy. Because joy is this inner thing, not this, I'm not happy. I'm not trying to be happy. God's job isn't to make you happy. God's job is, God's relationship with you gives you joy. Happiness is fleeting. Because how many of y'all been happy one minute and like it didn't take 30 seconds and you were unhappy? Come on. Like when you're watching the Cowboys play. Anyway, I don't know why I'm stuck on the Cowboys. You can be happy one minute and despondent the next. Need therapy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, happiness isn't God's job. Our relationship with God isn't for us to be these happy people. And I'm so glad we can be happy. But it's not things or stuff or getting your own way or doing what you want that makes you happy. Hey, we've tried that from humanity's tried that from the beginning of time to now. It doesn't work. But I tell you what does work, devoting yourself to Jesus, following his plan for your life. And you'd be amazed how much joy you can have even when the circumstances don't look good. Here's why. Because you know God has got your back. It's sometimes I get into situations where the devil attacks me or messes with me or something goes bad in life or we're not in a position I'd like to be or something happens that is, is adverse to, to, to our situation. And it'll get to a point sometimes that I'm not kidding, I start laughing. Now, there are times I get stressed too. Uh, there are times that I freak out just like everybody else does. But I'm just telling you, there are times that you, you, how many know that it feels like in life, I don't know if it's true, but it feels like in life when it rains, it pours. How many have ever been there where it's like something goes wrong and you're like, oh my gosh, what else could happen? Don't, you don't, you're like, I wish I hadn't said that because something else can happen. And it's just like the next day something bad happens and then the next day something bad happens and then the next day something. And you're like, at some point, you just have to laugh. You just have to laugh because here's why you laugh. You laugh because you know God's got this. You know he does. If you're faithful to him, if you're loving him, if you're doing what his word says, he got it. Even if that's not good grammar, he still got it. He's going to watch out for you. And some of the watching out for you, it's not just because, listen to me very carefully. It's not just because you're saved. 
But it's because you are literally living in the revelation of the principles of the word of God. Because I know a lot of Christians that are not living in faith. And I know a lot of Christians that are not living according to the revelation of God. And they're just like anybody else. They face struggles, they go down. Why? Because they're not living according to the word. They're not doing the things that God said, if you'll do this, this will produce this in your life. That's where we have to grow up. Look at your neighbor right now, say, grow up. I want us to begin or continue the process of growth and maturing towards achieving that goal. Here, Paul says, I have not already attained this. I haven't already been uh, 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 perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ laid hold of me. Now think of this, God has a purpose for you. The reason you're saved is because God laid hold of you. The word there literally means arrested. God arrested you. In other words, he got your attention. He he got your attention, he arrested you and he put you in his family. And because we don't find God, God finds us. See, the arrogance of us says that somehow we, we find God. We make a decision to follow Christ after the Holy Spirit has already begun to draw us to him. You thought you just came and made a decision. No, you think about it for a minute. Think about this person that talked to you and think about this person that talked to you. Think about when you went to bed the other night and you were thinking about this and you don't normally think about that. And think about when you got up the next morning and you were having thoughts about eternity or what's gonna happen to my life or what's gonna happen to my kids. What are all those thoughts? What are all those things? What are that feeling of I need a change, something needs, what is that? That's called the Holy Spirit touching your heart saying you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Come on, be a part of my family. Come on, Jesus finds us he woos us and then he, he he saves us and then he helps us to grow and to develop because we are kids in the father's family you don't want your kids not to grow up matter of fact we're dying for some of our kids to grow up I just wish you would grow up and the truth is I really believe that if we were to put you know the comparison together God's probably sitting at the head of the dinner table in our life saying come on come on it is time for you to grow up Quit playing religious games. Quit playing spiritual games. Quit being so inconsistent in your life. Quit being so immature in your life. All dads want their kids to be the best that they can possibly be. Listen, I think about my kids. I want them to be the best they can be. I want their life to turn out well. But here's the deal. I don't just want life to treat them well. I want them to treat life well. We as dads, we don't want just our, we're almost shamed nowadays for expecting anything out of our kids. That's too harsh. For letting our kids fail, that's too harsh. Really? It worked for me. I'm responsible. I take care of my family. I pay my bills. I do what God wants me to do with my life. You know how my dad treated me? With love and respect and dignity and discipline. And he taught me responsibility and taking responsibility for myself. And he taught me that there are certain expectations, not only that he has for me, but that God has for me and that we need to grow towards those expectations. And it's never that we feel like we've arrived because the apostle Paul, listen, let me just tell you something. If you think you're so spiritual today, then you feel like you have arrived. And I know that there are some Christians out there that do, but let me just set you straight. If Paul, the apostle who wrote two thirds of the new Testament is telling the Philippian church, I have not yet arrived. You got a long way to go. (laughs) Me too. Sometimes in this process of growth, we fight struggles and issues and they're hard. It's, It's hard. Life is not always easy. How many of you have experienced that sometimes life is just hard? And you know, it's not always the devil. I know we do fight against an enemy. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this age. But, but it's not always about the devil. Sometimes it's just life. And, and, and why do I tell you that? Why do you need to know that? Because I'm a fan of the devil? No, I'm not trying to defend the devil. I'm just telling you, you need to know your target. You can be sitting there, you can be sitting there, you know, uh, rebuking the devil and the devil have nothing to do with what you're going through. It could just be life. Could be because we live in a fallen world. Instead of rebuking the devil, you might want to just pray and ask God to give you clarity and revelation. Some of the problems you're having, come on, may because you're not being mature. 
may not be the devil or life. It may be, oh, dare I say it, you. Me. It could be because maybe we're making bad decisions and we're getting bad consequences, but we don't want to face the bad consequences, so we want to blame it on the devil. The devil's like, man, y'all can be bad all by yourself. You don't even need me. Right? The place we have to get to, though, is understand that there are expectations for us as Christians, and it's not just about being saved and having our sins forgiven. There is a growth process that comes afterwards. Jesus said that you can't be saved by works, but you have been saved unto good works. And not just good works of the law. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about good works of doing good or being good or allowing your life to grow and mature and become everything he purposed you to become. Paul said, God arrested me for a purpose, and now what I'm doing and what sure Christians do is they arrest that purpose C come here uh, you two right here Ch Ch Chase and, and, and Connor almost couldn't remember my son-in-law's name that's not good y'all could hurry oh I forgot the skinny jeans to stop you all right so this is Paul so Paul this is purpose this is Paul this is purpose say hello to Paul and purpose anyway so Paul is on the road to Damascus and on the road to Damascus, he is going to persecute Christians. He is a religious zealot. He is a Pharisee. He is absolutely 100% sold to the Jewish law. He thinks Jesus Christ is a heretic. He's going after Christianity. He's going after this so-called Messiah that he doesn't believe to be a Messiah. He's persecuting the church. He's giving arrest warrants. He's taking people to jail. He's watching people be stoned, holding people's coats while they stone Stephen. I mean, this guy was trying to take the church down single-handedly. And truthfully, he had the power to do it in the religious sense. Of course, you're not gonna win if you find yourself fighting God. And so he's on his way to Damascus and all of a sudden, God just arrests him. Actually knocks him down onto the ground and blinds his eyes and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? That was, that, that's when you could do that to your son-in-law, that always feels great, doesn't it? <laughs> Don't beat me in golf next time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. He grabbed his life and he said, I have a purpose for you. He said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you coming against me? Why are you attacking me? And Paul had one very good question. Who are you? And, and here's what Jesus responded. I am Jesus the Christ whom you persecute. Because when people persecute the church, you are persecuting Jesus. Now listen to me very carefully. I know the church hasn't been perfect and church make mistakes, but I know it's popular nowadays to lambast the church. Well, you just remember something. When you lambast the church of Jesus Christ, you're attacking Jesus himself. That's good. And that's what he did. He was attacking. He said, you're attacking me, Paul. And he said, he said the only thing you do say when someone knocks you down and blinds you, what would you like to me to do, sir? <laughs> That's exactly what he said, go read it. What would you like for me to do? And he said, go to this city, talk to Simon. He's gonna pray for you. He's gonna prophesy over you and show you the things you'll suffer for the kingdom of God. So what God did is he stopped Paul's life and he said, here's the purpose. You have a purpose. He arrested Paul for purpose. Here's the purpose. Come here, Chase. Stand over there. Now, God arrested Paul for the purpose. But Paul now has to arrest the purpose. Y'all settle down. But Paul has to arrest the purpose. This is what he's saying. He's saying, God has apprehended my life, but he didn't just save me. Now listen, before you go there, before you go there and say, well, that was the Apostle Paul and he was so important and that's not me. I'm just a regular person. Can you remember something real quick? I don't know what that was about, but can you remember something? Can you remember something? Can you remember this? He was talking to people just like you when he said this. He wasn't talking to a bunch of pastors and preachers. He was talking to Christians. And he was saying, God has arrested you 
for purpose. Now you have to arrest your purpose. You've been apprehended. I'm getting a kick out of hitting him. You, 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 you have to absolutely grab a hold. I've grabbed a hold of you. Now you have to grab a hold of it. And the question is, you guys can be seated. Give him a big hand. Took a beating this morning. So we've got to get to that place of maturity where we're, we're not just talking about God saved me and he forgave me of my sins and I'm so thankful for that. Yes, we want to always remember that and be aware of that. But we've got to move to the next phase of growth. If your kid stayed a toddler all of the time, you would get pretty tired of that. Anybody who's had a toddler, you barely make it through the toddler years. And for them to actually stay that way, somebody's getting kicked out of the house. I don't care, but I'm only five. Get out. <laughs> you know, the truth is we expect people who come into the kingdom and they're new to the kingdom, we expect them to deal and struggle and work through and all that. But when we've been in the kingdom a while, we can't continue to live our life like a toddler spiritually. We've got to begin to live our life like an adult spiritually. Yeah. Man, when you're born in the kingdom, Jesus, God sees you as a baby. But as you stay in the kingdom for a while and you learn the word and you get revelation, God expects you to use that revelation. One of the biggest things that keeps us immature is when we do get a revelation from the word, we do nothing with it. We just say, well, that's good. That was great to hear. I'm going to write a note about that. But nothing changes in our life because we're either perceiving it as an educational informational thing and we're not really receiving it as a re revelational thing. This is to change me. This is to grow me. This is to move me forward in my life. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's good. good. You go through these seasons of ups and downs and hardships and difficulties. I want to talk to you for a minute about what pushes us to the press. And I've only got uh, just a few minutes left. So I'm, I'm, I, I can't cover all of this. So I'm going to try to cover uh, what I think would be the most important to you today. And then if you want my notes later, I won't send them to you. <laughs> anyway, I will. I, I will. If you want to request them, you just call the office and we'll send you the notes. Um, what pushes us or pulls us from the press? Paul the Apostle said, I, I am not arrived, but this one thing I do. Now I want you to watch very importantly, uh, very closely. He, he says, this one thing I do. And then he goes on to say several things. But what he was saying is he was describing what he has to do to be able to do the one thing. What is the one thing the Apostle Paul did in that passage of Scripture? The one thing he did, the one singular focused thing he did was press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. That purpose, that destiny, that reason for my being. There's, there's a reason for your being, not just for your salvation, but for the reason you were created for. The re when God redeems you, he redeems you and the purpose he created you for. You need to understand that when you were created or born into this world, you, didn't, you weren't born and then God said, well, uh, to, to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they had a conference and said, what are we going to do with this person? They need something to do. That wasn't how it worked. The Bible said God knew you before you even formed in your mother's belly. Before you even formed in the womb, God knew you. Meaning he already had a thought about why he wanted you to be on this planet. So then when you get saved and he, Holy Spirit draws you and you get saved and make a commitment to Christ, what he does is he redeems you and he saves your soul and he forgives your sins and he gives you entrance into eternity in a heavenly eternity, but then he puts a claim on your purpose. And he starts facilitating those gifts, those skills, those talents, that personality to become everything he intended for you to become. And the way you get to where he intended for you to go is you start on the track of Romans chapter 8 verse 29 when he said that those who were predestined were also called and those who were called were called to be conformed into the image of his dear son. So the first track for you as a believer is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Billy Graham said it this way, being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. 
Now, the question then of our maturity is one simple question. And that is this. If today I am not more like Jesus than I was yesterday, something is wrong with my growth process. You say, well, now we're not perfect. We're not expected to be Jesus. Please stop it with that. No, you're not perfect and you're never going to be perfect. And Paul said, I am not perfected, but I am pushing and pressing towards perfection. There's a difference. I don't expect everything to be perfect for me or nor that I could be possibly be perfect. But here's what I am expecting, to press towards it. Why have we got this mindset that because we can't be perfect that we should just stay how we are? That's not what Jesus taught us. And it's not okay. I got to close, but before I do, I've got seven points. (laughs) What pushes us to the press? There are things that pull us from the press. Things that pull us from the press are exactly what Paul told us here. He said, one thing I do is press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He said, but first I have to forget those things which are behind me. And I have to look towards those things which are before me. In other words, he said, I have to stop worrying about the past and I start having a vision for the future. Many people cannot get out of being stuck in sin because they can't stop looking at it. It's called being sin conscious versus righteousness conscious. If I'm righteousness conscious, then I'm moving towards vision. I'm moving towards purpose. And what that means is I'm just trucking along saying, I know this is what God wants for my life for I'm shooting for that. Well, in the process of that, I may have, I may fail and I may go, oh, I messed up. I didn't get it right. I sinned. God, forgive me. Please change my life. But what I can't do is this. And so many Christians do this. I can't do this. Well, I'm not, I, I did it again. I did it again. And then get locked into the past. I did again. Okay, I'm not ever, I'm not ever going to do that again. So I'm walking along. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. That thing has trapped me and it's kept me back and it makes me feel so bad. And I'm so, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to mess with it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anymore. It just has, it was so alluring to me and it just keeps pulling me back and it just keeps pulling back. And I'm not going to do it. I tell you right now, I'm not going to do it because that thing has made my life a mess. And I tell you what, that, that thing has locked me in. I don't even know how I'm going to get free from that thing. I don't know. I'm doing it. Why am I doing it? I shouldn't be doing it. I'm doing it. Why? Because instead of being vision con- conscious and being position for vision for the future of the purpose of God in my life. I'm sin conscious and I'm just trying so hard not to do that. So I'm trying by my own effort to be righteous. Can I just tell you something? Trying by your own effort to be righteous will not make you righteous. The only thing to make you righteous is relationship with Jesus Christ and him changing your life. So the righteousness issue has been taken care of. The only thing that'll move you forward and keep you out of the past is purpose. So stop going, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to be good. I'm going to try to be good. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And start saying, this is what God created me for. And I'm not letting anybody tell me different. And I'm not letting anybody steal the promise of God from me. And I'm not letting anybody stop me. I'm not letting mediocrity of some other Christian keep me from being an on fire, dedicated, committed follower of Jesus Christ. I'm doing everything God said. I'm focused on the purpose. I'm focused on his design. I'm doing this and I'm not going back. Right? You do that and you'll worry less and less and less about those sins of the past or even sins of the present. Because you'll find yourself being so caught up in the presence of God that his righteousness will be lived out through you. Fruit is born, not attached. And the Bible said that a mature Christian is not one who operates in the gifts of the spirit, although we love those. It's one who operates in the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, temperance, faith, all of these things. All these things, but they're not things we attach. They're things that grow out of us. Why? Because we're moving forward in Christ. We're growing up as people. We're doing what the Bible says. We're seeking out his will and desire for our lives and it changes us. So what pushes us to the press? To take joy in Christ and the power of his word. To love him more than anything else. 
not to get the principle say, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to, no, to take joy in the relationship with Jesus, to just love him so much that nothing else compares, no other relationship compares, no other thing compares, no other activity compares, Jesus is the most important. I love him so much, I care for him so much, and I love what he loves. It presses us, taking joy in that relationship and the power of his word, getting in his word and studying his word and listening to his word. And the, the, the Bible says, the Bible says it's by faith or it's by, 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 faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word in Romans is what it says. And what that simply means is if we commit ourselves to listening to the word, then our hearing is opened up and we begin to hear from a spiritual place, not a physical place. And this is the last thing. Re worship and rejoice in your relationship with Christ. Understand it is in Christ that salvation is possible, not your works. But then you have to move past that and you have to understand, count your religious achievements as garbage and your pride as loss. Paul said, if anybody wants to brag about who they are religiously, I can brag more. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, which is one of the best tribes as far as th they were concerned in, in, in the children of Israel. And I, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. And according to the law, he said, I have absolutely been holy and upstanding and blameless according to the law and all these things. And then he went on to say, and I, excuse me for the graphic nature of it, but he said it in the Bible. I count all this as manure. That's what he said, dung. Y'all familiar with that? <laughs> Trash, garbage, all my pride, all this religious exercise, all these things that I made myself so good. Uh -uh. All of that means nothing to me. The only thing that means anything to me is the relationship with Jesus Christ. Because out of that relationship, that law has been put on my heart. And now out of my own nature, out of the nature of Christ that Christ has given me, I want to do what he's called me to do. It's time to grow up. Somebody say amen. amen. It's time to grow up. Well, so much more to say and no more time. If there's anything my dad taught me, it's to work hard and take responsibility and care about people. All these things are characteristics of the press. I want to challenge each and every one of you to ask yourself this question today. Why did Jesus save you? Listen to me. Focus on me. Don't worry about her. Look at me. Why did Jesus save you? Well, your first answer is obviously to forgive my sins. Oh, no, no, no. That's the beginning. But that's not only the reason why he saved you. Why did he save you? What's the purpose? Can you tap into the idea of that? There's more to this than just you getting to heaven. What is the purpose of you? Are you in true fellowship with him and his resurrection and his sufferings? Paul said, I'm in true fellowship. You remember we talked about last week that koinonia, that's not just friendship. It's fellowship. It's a bond around a cause. Are you in true fellowship with Christ around the purpose of his kingdom in your life? Or are you just being a friend that hopes to get in because he likes you? Or are you really living out the purpose and goal of your life? Hey, he's taking care of that part. He's taking care of that heaven part. He's taking care of that righteousness part. Now, you need to take care of the rest by submitting yourself to him and saying, I'm no longer doing this for me. This is about God. It's about his kingdom. It's about me living my life full on. My dad taught me everything I know about that and everything that God wants for my life. And I'm telling you, if we dads, listen to me, just speaking to the dads for a minute, if you want to do something significant for your kids, then do two things. Number one, teach your kids about purpose. Teach your kids about true achievement, not activity. Teach your kids about true purpose in life. And then for God's sake, show them how it works. You do that, those two things, you're going to have kids who love God, who love you, 
who love his church and who live for purpose. Period. That's it. Isn't God good? Let's give him a hand clap of praise.